not look back at our past, but press forward to the, to the prize of conforming to the person of Christ. And uh, so I want to push into that a little further with a different angle. But, uh, but as we run, uh, we can all grow weary. I think you figured that out, hadn't you, if you live more than five minutes? Uh, that uh, the race can be tiring. And so it's uh, wise for us to check our provisions and our, our, um, our preparation as we go. So we know what's ready for, it will know that way, if we're ready for what's coming around the bend. A uh, lack of such preparation is what caught the, the five foolish virgins, you may remember in the scripture, who, uh, who were invited to a wedding. But they, uh, they got so excited about going to the wedding, they forgot to prepare their lamps. And in those days, uh, part of the excitement of the wedding was they never told you when it was going to be. I and mean, we, we sent out announcements, we tell everybody what time to be here, and all that stuff in the old Jewish tradition. That was a surprise. They didn't tell you when the wedding was. They, you, you, uh, they assembled everybody at a party, but, but they didn't tell you what time. You, you could tell by the noise that it was time. But they didn't tell you, so it could happen in the middle of the night, and because of that, uh, that's why those uh, five particular virgins were considered foolish, because they weren't prepared. They were excited about being uh, there for the wedding, but they were a lot less thrilled about preparing for the trip. A night wedding call would have meant traveling over very uneven and rough terrain. They didn't have sidewalks back in those days. Um, and so to, to do so at night without light, would uh, pretty much ensure that you're going to fall and, and hurt yourself probably pretty pretty badly. Uh, so that's why those lights were so important. In other words, they would even you'll notice that in the in the story that Jesus gives to that, that those five foolish virgins didn't didn't even attempt to make the wedding trip without having their lamps ready. Once they realized they had to go, the first thing they did was run back to the store and get some oil for their lamps. They, they just they didn't even try to make the trip. They had to be prepared, and they were not. So obviously, uh, preparation is a major part of running that race. Uh, but here's the thing about preparation. It, it often feels like we're standing still instead of preparing, so, so we don't like the feel of that. Uh, and so we can often be fooled into thinking that we should be running our guts out, even if it means running empty-handed. Surely it's better to run your hands empty than it is to stand still, right? Uh, well, nothing could be further than the truth. Uh, preparation is the most important element of winning a race. If you're not prepared, you're not going to win. And we, get, guys, we are in a race, whether we like to run or not. I'm not big on running, but I know I'm in a race, and I can tell it by the circumstances and, and the situations that surround me on a daily basis. And I'm pretty sure you can too. You, you know that you're. If nothing else, you know that you have opposition. Sometimes we forget that we're in a race, but you know you have opposition. So uh, let's look at some of the preparation that we get from uh, the book of Revelation in uh, chapter 14. And so I'm going to start at verse 14. I think it's a yeah, that's an easy book to find. Just get all the way to the back. Listen to the Lord. Listen 
So when he tells you somebody is in a place where they can be ministered to and they'll receive it, because uh, if, if the fruit's not ripe, do you think God would want you to pick it? Probably not. Have you ever tried to taste it? Like, for instance, a, a banana mm. is a good example. Uh, I love bananas, my goodness, and I have uh, a few times in my life uh, gotten a hold of some green ones because I was really anxious to have a banana until I bit into one that was really green. And that just turned my lips inside out. Uh, I just soon licked a lemon as to eat one of those. And uh, I just didn't appreciate it at all. I lost all of my enjoyment of bananas by having one <laughs> that was that green. So fruit is good when it's ripe. And, and the same is true of the Lord's harvest in us. If we're not right, if we haven't been ready, then we need to be left alone until God has uh, done the work he needs to do to prepare us. Well, uh, and I've said this before, and I'll say it, we never find God. The truth is God comes to us. He finds us. He shapes the things that go on around us and in us to, to, the, to draw us to a place of readiness and makes us right uh, for him, for his presence. So uh, we need to be careful to let him do his work. But secondly, I want you to know this, that he doesn't work alone. And that's why it was so important that we cooperate with him by listening to what he's saying and what he's doing. The sickle that he thrust into the earth in those verses is us, the church. So his timing will always be perfect. Our situation is, will, will we be ready? Will, will our hearing and our understanding be where it needs to be so that when he's ready, we're also ready, and then we'll be effective. Because really, we're just good tools, or we're bad tools. If we stay, if we stay in the box when we need to be out, being turned on somebody's life, then we're, we're an ineffective tool. So I want to look at a few ways that will help keep us uh, with a sharp edge. And uh, I found this wonderful passage over in 2 Kings chapter 6. Uh, I'm going to flip over there to verse 1. Interesting enough, they uh, 
they asked to go to the Jordan. And you guys know from all of your hymns and things that we've seen, and if you pay attention, the Jordan River is often used as a reference point for spiritual life, spiritual living. We talk about people when they die, they say they crossed the Jordan. They left the natural, and they went into the supernatural. And so these guys, when they say, when the prophet says to them, let's go to the Jordan, if that's where we want to go, then that's where we need to go to grow. That's where we need to go to expand our influence and, and to, to position ourselves to move ahead into what the Lord would have us do. We've got to leave where we are, and we've got to go to the Jordan. Because that's, that's always the picture you get out of the, the Jordan, that it's taking you to a higher place, a supernatural place in God that, that is... Uh, it may be your eternal home, but it's also a place where, where you can get out of your flesh, which is a wonderful place to be. It's out of that control of what you feel, taste, and see, which can so easily dominate our thinking. And so after they're sent, though, uh, they're wise enough, and this also I found very simple but very important. They're wise enough not to want to go alone. They asked the prophet immediately, would you please accompany us? And we, folks, are far better off than they were. All they could ask for was the prophet to go with us. But we, we have the Holy Spirit in us. But it's optional whether or not we depend upon him. He is with us. If we're born again, we know he lives inside of us. But that doesn't ensure ever that he's going to do his work unless we choose to be submissive to him. So that's an optional thing that we, we need to take seriously, that we're asking for him to guide the way and to open the doors and to do what he's doing. And the last thing I saw in this particular passage, at least, that was really interesting to me was the results of one man's efforts uh, to cut down those trees. As, as we said, his axe head flies off uh, the handle in the middle of, of cutting trees. And this, this really reminded me of several things. One is he automatically acknowledged that he borrowed the axe. So if you borrow a tool, especially something like that to go to work with, and that's your instrument to succeed with, uh, do you think that you might would want to check it out since you borrowed it? You didn't know the condition of it. Obviously, it wasn't your axe. He never, apparently never thought about checking his axe. But anybody who especially would use an axe for a living Probably make sure the axe head was on good. I remember as a kid, my daddy played this, uh, he thought it was cool, but my daddy had a strange taste when it came to birthday presents. Uh, some of you guys got toys and bottle cars and, and whatever, nice, this and that. Uh, my daddy, I don't know whether it was, was out of some wicked sense of humor or, or what it was, but I remember when I was 11 years old, I got so excited on my birthday my daddy said, come out here to the car. I got something in the trunk for you. And I was all excited for my birthday present. And uh, he had one out of two things right. One, he knew that one of my favorite colors was red. And so he opened up the trunk and voila, I had a red axe for my birthday. And he was so happy that he got me one with a short handle so I could swing it better. And I tried my best to smile when I picked that axe up out of the trunk because I didn't want to hurt my daddy's feelings. But I was not excited. I was not thrilled to get an axe for my birthday because chopping wood just wasn't on my list of things to do uh, to celebrate. Because, I mean, I went and played with it about 10 minutes in the backyard and I, I hit my funny ball on my knee one time with it. And after about 10 or 12 whacks, I had blisters coming up on my little wimpy hands I had. And I was like, oh, this ain't good. You know, but my daddy was thrilled for it, and I tried to play with it as much as I could. But I, I wasn't really the best at swinging axes. Um, but I did have sense enough, as I played with it over time, to make sure that axe head was on there good and tight. Because they can slip out. There's all kind of tricks for making an axe head stay on. And if, uh, if you use one much, you know how to make sure that thing stays put. But this guy, again, in his rush to want to go to work and do the work of the Lord, in this case, this was God's will. He wasn't in the wrong place, even though his axe head went flying off. He was with the prophet of God. He was doing the very thing he was supposed to be doing. But he hadn't checked his uh, provisions very well. He didn't check to see what shape his axe was in. He just went swinging. And as a result, the axe head flies off. 
And you know there's no way to fix that. And so he cries out. He's got sense enough, and I give you credit for this. Because some of us, especially in the service of God, we'll keep doing the same old thing, whether it's working or not. So that at least we can say we were faithful to do what we do. But that's really not the point with God, that you're faithful in doing what you do. What God wants to know is, are you faithful in doing what I told you to do? Because the thing with God is when God tells you to do something, he puts favor on it. He puts a, a, a blessing on it. If God told you to do it, it will be blessed. It will be favored. If God didn't tell you to do it, you can do the same thing over and over all day long and think, man, I'm working so hard for God. And no one will ever notice and nothing will ever happen, and nothing will ever change, but you will at least feel better because you're doing something. That's not really what we want to do, is it? I mean, sometimes we fall into that, but that's not how God operates. When, when God wants you to do something, he'll bring fruit out of it, if it's him that wants it. But that gentleman at least was smart enough to know that if he just kept swinging an axe handle with no axe head on it, how many trees was he going to cut down? Yeah. Take a mathematician to figure that out. There's no tree that's going to fall without an axe in place. And since he couldn't get to it, there again, he had sense enough to cry out. We got to say, hey, help. I wonder if we still have sense enough to cry out when we see that the trees aren't falling. Can we cry out and say, God, would you please come and show us what to do here? My axe head is not where it belongs. It's at the bottom of this lake whatever that was. And, and only God can throw a stick in the river or, and, and make a, an iron axe head float to the surface so you can get your hands back on it. Uh, you may not need an axe head to rise back to the surface of the water, but you have something that you need from God that you can't do yourself. In order to be successful, there's something you need. And so I just want you to, as, as we go through this story, pay attention to, to where your provisions are, are weak. And, and that's easy to tell. And look where you're not succeeding. Look, look where you're stuck. You're not moving. It means the tools in your hand either are the wrong tools or, or they just need to be sharpened. They, they need to be more finely tuned for the situation you're under. So I think the guy had some of it going on pretty good. Oh. Uh, as I said, though, even, even the right tool has to be re refreshed if it's going to be defective. Uh, I, I read a devotional this week. I thought it was really, really neat. Uh, and it's a true story that the man brings out, and, and his dad was a, a, a lumberjack back in the days when there was no such thing as chainsaws for, for the timber industry. So they cut down trees with axes. That's the only way they cut them down. I know you've seen, you've seen the modern equipment. It's fascinating to watch them clear timber these days because they all sit on these big spinning devices. They don't even have to get out of the thing, and they just go through the forest and spin round and round and round. They just cut the, the thing will cut the tree, pick the tree up, and lay it down in a neat stack while you're sitting in behind there pushing buttons. It's amazing how fast they can clear timber these days. But in this day, this man did it the old-fashioned way with an axe. And he said his dad would go out and go to work every day, and he cut every time he cut down a tree, he stopped. And nobody else did this around him. They thought he was kind of silly for doing this. He would cut down the tree, he'd sit on the stump, and he'd take a file out of his belt and sharpen that ax again. Real good. Fine-tune that ax, he'd go to the next tree, chop down that tree. As soon as that tree fell, sit on that stump, sharpen that ax. And he said everybody sort of made fun of him. Like, man, that's just, you're just killing time. And you ought to be cutting trees. And every time you cut one out, you sit down and take a break. Sharpen your axe. The only thing is, at the end of the day, just about every single day, this man cut down more trees than anybody else in the, in the, in the yard. And not only did he cut more trees down, he wasn't as tired. Because those guys were beating themselves to death with a dull axe. Time after time. Trying to get those trees down. He wasn't doing that. Because his axe was sharp every time he swung it. What does that say to us? Is it tells you one thing. Preparation is worth the time it takes if you want to be effective. Sometimes you need to sit down. 
and just be still. You sharpen what's already in you. Every one of you guys have, have talents, you have abilities, you have gifts that are from God and are, are, are put in you to put to use. Every last one of you. There's not a one of you in here. By the way, if you notice at the very beginning of the story when they said, uh, you know, we, we, we need to grow, we, we don't fit here. The prophet didn't say to them, well, I want some of you guys to go ahead and go get some beams from the Jordan and let's start building. He said, all of you, go. Go to the Jordan. In other words, God never leaves any of us out in the talent line, in the gifting line. We don't all have the same talents. We don't have the same giftings. But we all have something that is of vital importance. But it needs to be sharpened. It needs to be refreshed. It needs to be kept in the ready because otherwise it, it may go to waste. So, but do not uh, think that there's whatever you have is less than what somebody else has because everything is vitally important. It all needs to be in place. Uh, we were talking this morning about trumpet players and people who can do instruments, and I'm just not one of those. And if, if you needed me to play the trumpet back in my day in school, uh, you better call Mr. Pittman down there because he could play the trumpet. I would work a flip. I mean, uh, mine, you know, sort of made a funeral nerd sound bad. I just couldn't get it. It was bad. And uh, so I, I, I learned to play my trumpet softly in the band so that hopefully they could hear the notes that I was missing. Because I can assure you I missed more than I hit. But all that did for me was tell me that my Talents didn't lie with music. Uh, I did find that I could talk pretty well. And uh, once my knees quit shaking, uh, I, I got to where I saw that God had something for me to do that involved talking. Uh, but even that had to be fine-tuned. The first time or two I did this, it wasn't pretty. I had to hold on for dear life to keep from falling over. I was shaking so hard. Um, but, but God can do it. If, if we're willing to give God even that which shakes you to your teeth, uh, if it's what he wants to bless, he'll strengthen it and he'll make it come to, come to what he wanted it to do. So uh, the main thing, and again, I, I'm not in any way trying to tell you for sure what your area is that you need to prepare. But I'll give you this one that I know will help. Um, and as you search the Lord's heart, I guarantee you he'll tell you what needs preparing. He'll tell you what needs more work, and he'll get you in shape if, you're, if you want to be in shape. Uh, but waiting upon the Lord, I want to read this passage out of Isaiah 40, uh, starting at verse 28. I was just going to read one verse, and I read several around it, and I said that was too good to skip all of that. Uh, so I'll just start at verse 28 of chapter 40. It says, uh, Do you not know, and have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. You know, waiting, you just see so many things in there that are beneficial. You see so much strength and so much power coming back into your life as you wait on the Lord. I, I will not tell you that waiting is always pleasant. Uh, I have experienced waiting that was pleasant. I've experienced waiting that was more like a root canal without painkiller. So I've had both. But I will tell you that waiting on God will do this. It will deaden the very quick responses from the flesh that misguide you and misdirect you. Uh, and again, that's why they went to the Jordan to rebuild in the first place. It uh, was because the Jordan was that place in the spirit that will stop the move of the flesh. Uh, waiting also replaces improper impulses which come uh, which from uh, I missed my line there. That causes eternal uh, the eternal is where, where 
where God is always working. Every benefit, every blessing, every favor of God has eternal results. Uh, so when the axe head flies off, even if you're waiting, but if you're waiting with the Lord and your axe head flies off, uh, that axe head can be made to float again. And life will, will continue according to purpose and not just the circumstances that fall our way. Man, if we watched all of our circumstances, guys, we ain't going to be a mess. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but circumstances rarely line up in our benefit, in our favor. Have you noticed that? <laughs> they, they, they tend to be obstacles more than they are blessings. Uh, and God knows that. And God knows how to work through those situations to bring us still back to purpose. To actually use the very things that are obstacles to become muscle in our spiritual life. And I've said that several times. So I just want you to evaluate this week. Where, where's the area where you're being, where you're just hindered? You're just not moving at all. Uh, it, it may be that you just need to be still and listen for the voice of the Lord. It may be that there's something that just needs to be deposited in the altar, not necessarily up here, but you know, uh, wherever you are, there's an altar. It's called submission. Submission is an altar that goes with you everywhere you go. And you can just lay anything down at any time and say, God, this, this is a problem. This, this is an area where I'm not moving. And I do need to expand my influence because, you know, uh, every time I, I see a, a young man like I talked about earlier who, who passes so soon, you know, you always wonder, did you, did you have as much influence in that life as you could have had? Did you, when you had time with those people, did you say the things that mattered? Did, did you say anything or do anything that, that prospered the kingdom of God in your life? Or did you just talk about the weather and you know, whatever, whatever just happened to be? Uh, you, you need to be careful, you need to be sensitive when you're in the grocery stores. When you need to be sensitive when you're at the gas station because you just never, ever know Who's going to come your way? Uh, I had a man approach me in a restaurant a few years ago, and uh, he had just buried his son. Just buried, just left his funeral. And he was so despondent. Uh, I mean, just the, the boy made some horrible decisions and uh, made some bad, bad choices. And, and he was just down. And so I encouraged him as much as I could and uh, prayed for him. Told him we pray for him. In fact, I, I put him on Facebook, and, and literally, I think I had 130, 150 people who, who joined with me and prayed for this man. Uh, so that was not a wasted encounter. You know, as soon as I saw him, as soon as he began to talk, I knew this guy, he is hurting, and he's trying to hide it, trying to brush it off like it was no big deal. But you could see through all of that. And so anytime you get those opportunities, that's what that is. It's a tragedy, and it's horrible. But God puts you in those places to plug in so that you can be the bomb of Gilead, that you can be that healing source that begins to work in somebody's life. So just be available to that. Well, whatever your situation is, wherever you go, do not consider yourself, I'm just not worthy, I'm just not good enough. We already know that about ourselves, don't we? Do we really need to remind ourselves that we're not good enough and we're not blah, 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 and all that? Just forget that. Just realize that somebody's in front of you that needs something and you're there, you must be good enough. Because if you're there at the right moment, the right time, you're good enough, or you wouldn't be there. God would have put somebody else there. So if you're there, tag, you're it. <laughs> that simple. So, uh, uh, so as we close, I just want you to, to be aware, be prepared, or, or at least be in a position for growth this, this week. I'd encourage you through the next several weeks, I'd like to, to really just kind of have some feedback from you guys over the next month. Take a few weeks and pray about this, but pray to see what God might be doing in you to prepare you to do something on a larger scale for your community, for the people around you, that the church could cooperate with you to see that it comes to pass. So, I mean, I just want you to be praying about that, be thinking about what, what is it that God is putting in me that I need to put to use that I need to make happen or in my little area. Because uh, he has that for us. He has that for us. And I think if we can listen to the Lord and we can team up, we, we can make some stuff happen here.
It's really not us doing it. All we really need to do is hear the voice of the Lord. See what he says do. Submit to what he says do. And then agree with him and move with him. And see, that will guarantee fruit for us. It will guarantee God's favor over your life and what you're doing. And you'll see the result of that. And uh, that's why you're here, by the way. That's why you're alive. Not just why you're in this building. That's why you're breathing. And so you can do that. You know, because really, the Lord wants you with him. The only reason he's loaned you out to the earth is so that you can bear fruit. Otherwise, he loves you so much. This may sound like it is a love, but he loves you so much. That if, if it weren't for the need for you to be here, he'd already take you to himself. He'd much rather have you right up there next to his bosom. That's where he'd like to have you. But for right now, you're needed. You're needed right here. And so that's why he left you here. So let's make good use of our reason for being here. And see what he has to do. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Father, for, for your blessings over us. We thank you that our blessings are meant to be tools to, to move and to change us and to help change the world around us. To bring the light of the gospel where darkness has overtaken so many lives and brought so much destruction. Lord, I thank you that you rebuild what has been torn down. And that, that in itself is a huge testimony to the glory and the goodness of God. That there's nothing that can be destroyed and wiped out that you can't rebuild, replace, make better, and make new by your spirit. And that's a testimony to the world of the goodness of our God. And we thank you for that.